Welcome everyone to tonight's episode of Profound States. Tonight's special guest is Jesse Peake. He's an experiencer, a certified MUFON field investigator for the state of Pennsylvania, a MUFON uh, experiencer resource team uh, member, uh, an ERT mentor, uh, a MUFON case assistant group member, a uh, scientific Coalition for UAP Studies member, that's one I haven't heard of, uh, a project director for the for Project Batek 404. Uh, he's co-founder and team lead for the UAP Medical Coalition. He's a podcast radio host at MUFON Encounters Worldwide. He's a uh, published writer in the MUFON Monthly Journal and Flying Disc, Disc Press. He's ex-Army 13 Bravo, that's artillery cannon crew member in the Army National Guard. Uh, he did training at Fort Sill in Oklahoma. He's a counselor for five years teaching classes to young adults. He's an Eagle Scout. Oh, very cool. Certifications, he has certifications in astronomy, space exploration, space advocacy, mental health. Uh, he has a Be There certificate, whatever that is, a case and he has certifications in case management. He has, he's been introduced to uh, computer technology, basics of digital imaging, Google Analytics, PowerPoint, public speaking and disposition into investigations. His website is, oh, he's got two websites, Project Batek, B-A-T-T-E-C-H 404.wordpress.com and ufoencountersworldwide.wordpress.com. Welcome to tonight's show, Jesse Peake. Thank you, Charles. I, I appreciate you having me on today. Looking forward to it. Well, let's get jump jump right into it. So, uh, what was the very first odd thing that happened to you in your life of any kind? So I really I, I looked back at all that kind of stuff actually later when I got into research in the field, um, because when when you're young at, at that age, when you when that, when you have weird stuff happen to you. It's all based off of religion, Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, you know what I mean? All things that aren't really real, and we say they are. So, um, but the first thing that ever happened to me is supposedly I slept walk. Um, I was about five or six years old, five years old. Um, we lived in a duplex apartment building on the top floor, um, at which time I could not unlock all three of the locks on the door. I could not reach them at that time. Um, I woke up to knocking on the downstairs apartment door at my cousin's house, and that's how I woke up. Um, I don't remember getting out of bed. I don't remember unlocking the doors, which I could not reach at the time, or walking down two full flights of stairs. Um, so that was we, we, we just pushed that aside to me sleepwalking, and we never kind of really talked about it after that point. Um, I think everybody was a little weirded out by it. You know, it was 3 a.m. in the morning. It wasn't like it was during the day. Um, so that was the one thing that happened to me that was very, very, very strange. Um, How old were you? Five, five years old. Okay. Uh, I couldn't even reach it. We had a, a deadbolt on the door, the chain, and a regular, uh, I could reach the doorknob, but not the top ones. Um, and then as, as time went on a little bit, we moved into our new house. Um, oh, hold on, hold on, back up. Where were you when you did sleep, sleep walk, sleepwalk? I was, was in, I was in the apartment duplex. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, I where, where, where did you live at the time? Uh, this was in Philadelphia, uh, far northeast Philadelphia. Oh, so you've never moved out of your? Okay, oh, go ahead. No, go I've ahead. lived in Philly my whole life. Uh, okay, go ahead. Born go and raised. Um, so that was really strange, but I never looked at it as strange until I got in the field of UFOs. You know what I mean? Finding yeah. out, you know, you could be taken and put back in the wrong place. So I kind of that's always kind of been on my radar now. And then a few years later, we moved to uh, a lesser part of Northeast Philadelphia. We got our house um, and we were out on New Year's Eve and we were coming home um, from being with the family on New Year's Eve. We opened up a couple of gifts um, and we're sitting at a stoplight. I'm in the back seat of the, the, the vehicle and I'm looking for Santa Claus because, I, you know, we know he's flying up in the sky when I'm that age. I was probably between eight, nine years old, maybe seven, somewhere in there. And I'm looking up and I see this light. And it comes and it drops out of the sky out of the dark clouds because it was a very cloudy night and it it was bright white and it it got super big then it went low again went up back into the clouds came back down 
did the same thing, got really big and hung there for a minute, went back up in the same position and was just gone. And I'm screaming in the back seat. It's Santa Claus, you know, my mom and dad are in the front and they're like, oh, my God, we got to hurry up and get you home and get you to bed. That means he's almost at the house. You know what I mean? So that was brushed off as that. And I'm, I'm sure the, my parents thought that I was just seeing some random lights in the sky. There was no FAA lights on and no green lights. It was not a moving object. It was stationary. So it wasn't, you know, flying or, or moving around at all, which was very odd to me. And drones back then weren't weren't around today like they are. Um, so I've kind of weaned out most of the things that it could possibly not be. Um, and I'm not sure what besides what else it could be if, besides a UAP or a UFO. And when I say UFO, UFO is not alien. UFO is an unidentified flying object. So I like to get that squared away. So it was a white light. Yes, bright, bright, bright white light. And they grew in size and then got small and then did it again. So did it have, um, did it have a defined surface or, or just, a, just a light? Just the light. Just the light. I seen a ball. It looked like a, a small orb at first, and then it got probably two to three times the size of it. Back down to that small orb again, back in the clouds, came back down the same uh, same position and did the same thing again. So how close did it get to you at the very at the closest? So we were we were directly underneath of it. So it was directly above me out the back seat window of the car when we were stopped at the at the light. Um, directly above me watching this that's how i knew it didn't move because it was the same position you know what i mean it wasn't far away to where i couldn't tell if maybe it moved or not it was right above us i had a clear view of it um and i still remember it to this day because of the santa claus and you're going to remember that as a kid you know i saw santa um so what what in my mind was it was santa's sleigh peeping down letting me know he was on his way to our house that's what we made it that's what you know my parents made it that's what i made it Oh, go, uh, what was the next thing that happened to you? So um, throughout life, as I got a little older in my teenage years, um, you know, I was, oh, we always, you know, some of my family was religious, some of us weren't. Um, I always, you know, came up as I was Irish Catholic. Um, most of the family was Catholic, so we always knew that, you know, my mom would always say, you know, we had guardian angels looking over us, and both of my uncles had passed uh, recently at the time. Um, and I started having these weird gut feelings. Um, Philly is not the greatest of, of cities to live in sometimes, and there's things that happen. And there'd be days where I'd be walking down the streets with my friends or something like that, and I would get a gut feeling not to go into that area or not walk up that street. Um, and I come to find out they call this ESP, extrasensory perception. It's like having a sixth sense, as they say. And I would not walk up that street and then find out later the next day, you know, so-and-so was robbed on that block. You know what I mean? And maybe that could have been us if we walked up that block. And I had these kind of feelings. And my mom would, I would tell my mom about them and, and she would say that's your guardian angel. It might be your uncle's looking down on you, protecting you, looking over you because they were, you were, we were so close. Um, this happened a couple times, quite a few times actually. Um, got us out of different situations where I could have been jumped by a group of kids. Um, other ones where I could have gotten robbed, like I said, um, so that kind of stuff happened throughout my teenage years, all the way through high school, things like that. I always had weird feelings and, and, and you know, could sense things and differently than other people. Um, you know, and then I always get that back to being street smart, um, you know, always being on the streets, knowing what to look for. But, um, you know, it was always that gut feeling, the same kind of thing all the time. Um, and then I started getting into the field of ufology. I started finding out, um, you know, I was watching all the TV shows, Ancient Aliens, In Search of, the original In Search of. Um, and I just started learning about the history. It took, it took me by surprise because I was like really interested in the subject of ufology. So I took some couple of years and learned all the history, got real involved with it. Um, and once I think I was like two, first year of MUFON, um, I'm with my dad, who was a bit of a skeptic at the time, in the beginning when I first got into this field. So, you know, I really didn't talk to my mom and dad about things like that. And, you know, they knew I was involved with MUFON um, and they were OK with it. And we happened to be driving down during the middle of the day in Northeast Philadelphia on a main avenue, Tarzell Avenue, very busy traffic, um, both ways. And my dad actually points out some objects in the sky. I had no idea they were even there. He's seen them first. Um, and he points out and he says, what are, what is that? And I, and I look and I had just gotten off my cell phone and there are four gold orb-like objects flying in a two and two formation 
behind one another. Um, as I'm seeing these things, I'm trying to grab from my phone, and I'm asking him to keep an eye on them and asking him what they are. He has no idea what they are. He's never seen anything like this before in his life. He's like, I have no idea. This is really, really odd. So I'm trying to take a video. I, I just got off the phone. My phone is not working properly for me to take a, a video of this. So I want evidence of it. Um, it was good that I had him with me anyway, so I could verify that, but I wanted more to be able to share with everybody. Um, and it wasn't working. My phone started doing weird things with the buttons. And so I'm tumbling, I'm fighting with it. And we're driving alongside these objects at the time. They're at our right, maybe a little bit forward to us to the right. And as I'm fumbling with the phone, they switch from a two and two formation to a single file. Um, which usually you see jets do this kind of thing, moving in and out of formations. And we did this in the military as well. And to me, that showed intelligence of these objects. They weren't just balloons floating in the sky or things like that. Um, once we hit a stoplight, these, these objects continued to go forward. And my phone clicked on and I was able to take two still photos. But before I took the photos, the first and second object disappeared like that. They didn't fly away. They didn't zoom off disappeared one at a time. The first one went, the second one went, and I was able to get two still photos of the last two gold objects, which I still have to this day. Um, I had no idea why the phone acted up. It was a brand new phone. I, it, it blew my mind. I was extremely pissed off about it. When we got home, I wanted to show my mom the still photos of the two objects that, we, that I was able to take. And when I went through my phone, there was actually a video recording on my phone, but I, did, I was not able to take anything. And it recorded the entire situation of me fighting with the phone, talking about the objects that we're seeing, that I'm trying to get the phone to work and it's not working. So it recorded that entire situation, which I had, I didn't do that. And it was black, so it wasn't recording video, it was just recording the sound. Um, so I also found that very odd. And uh, later in years, I, I did a lot of research. And that's what Project Batek is, is investigating and researching electrical malfunctions that are associated with UFO sightings. Um, there's been many, many encounters like this. Leonard Stringfield was someone that was very uh, big into the field. He was a MUFON, KUFO, Starcap, a bunch of, uh, he wrote a couple books as well. He was very involved. Um, and one of his big cases was he was flying uh, three days before the World War II had ended over Tokyo on one of these jets. And two, un three unidentified objects came up on the left wing of a C-46 cargo plane and the engine began to fail. Um, as they started to dive out of the sky, um, the UFOs then took off and the engine kicked back on after they flew away and they landed safely in Tokyo. Um, and I, I started coming across a lot of cases like this. And then I realized that my phone malfunctioned at the time that we were riding side by side with these objects. And once we hit that stoplight and they continued to go in that one and switch into that single file formation, my phone kicked back on. And through our research at Project Bad Tech, and we're coming up one year or two on this, we have the largest data on EM cases today, and we're in, we're in collaboration with KUFOS, um, BUFON, the British UFO Network, and the UAP Medical Coalition. And we've come to find out that there is actually a range in which UFOs are usually in for your electronics to malfunction. So it made sense that that's when the phone kicked back on when we hit that stoplight. My phone malfunctioned the entire time we were riding side by side, but once it hit that light, the phone kicked back on. I was able to take the two still photos of it. So. I went on and I continued to investigate cases for a couple of years. Um, I joined the ERT team, which is the experience or resource team, part of MUFON. Um, the sighting cases are all nuts and bolts. The ERT deals with uh, abductions, um, close encounters, implants, et cetera. Um, and I started getting really involved with that, helping people, um, doing it, you know, meeting people face to face, um, helping them with their experiences. Some of these individuals had a hitchhiker effect which I was unaware of when I first started investigating the cases. So I started to come home and I'd be in my room at night and little things would happen. I'd hear little knocks in my room and and I wouldn't think nothing of it because I had my fan going, you know, not thinking nothing. My cat's in the room, she heard it too, you know what I mean? So I knew I heard something, but I always brushed it off. You know what I mean? Maybe it was the next door neighbor, we live in row homes. Maybe I'm hearing somebody next door just bang on the wall. So uh, the nights go on, uh, things start to get a little louder, things start to happen. And then I'm starting to wake up in the middle of the night um, by feeling as if I'm being tugged or being touched on my legs and my feet. 
And then it progressed to being touched up on my chest and having pressure on my chest as if something was sitting on me and waking up to that, breathing, gasping for air. And then it got to the point where I was being pushed against the wall physically to the point where I was coming up with bruises in the morning on my arms and my legs and my fingers. Um, physically pushed to the, to the point where I was smacking this wall and being woken up. And I had no idea. And it continued to happen at the same time around two, three o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, now, the cat would always be in the room with me and she would and she started to sit at the bottom of my bed and and look as if something was in my room, but I'm not seeing the something. And she just like she does when people come over. She watches the people person. She watches people. Um, she would sit at the end of the bed and I'd hear these little noises and she'd be looking at it as if somebody's walking in my room, walking back. And then as if they're not there anymore and then come back and lay on the bed with me. Um, very strange. Um, so I started looking into animal effects and Linda Zimmerman, who is a big time researcher author, she wrote a book on animal reactions to UFOs. Um, animals have a different sense than us and can see in different light frequencies that they can hear different sound frequencies than we can. And, and what it comes down to is that we believe that animals can actually see ghosts and spirits and things that we're unable to see. Um, if we were able to use the entire part of our brain, we'd be able to see that as well. Um, so I got weirded out by the situation. It got worse. Um, so I needed help and I didn't have access to a hypnosis or hip to get hypnotherapy done to maybe find out if I'm something's happening. I'm just not remembering. So I was like, let me go uh, see about a remote viewer, get a remote viewer to kind of look at my situation, see what's going on. Maybe they can give me some answers and see some things that I'm not and maybe give me the answers to them. Um, so I went to a MUFON meeting one night and the speaker that night happened to be a media, uh, a remote viewer media. And her name is Margie Kay. She's the assistant state director for Missouri MUFON. Um, and this is, this is my introduction to her. Um, and she actually, I had asked her a couple of questions at the end of the, the meeting. Um, and I asked, I told her about my situation. I said, something's happening, but I did not tell her where it was happening. I didn't tell her, you know, my cat was seeing things, nothing like that. I just told her I'm getting woken up, you know what I mean, when I'm sleeping. So she she says, get with me after the, after the meeting. I sent her an email after the meeting. She said, um, let me, uh, I'll remove your situation and I'll, I'll send you an email back. Um, she asked where I lived and that was it. So I told her Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, and she emailed me back and what she stated was that she has never seen anything like this before. She said, what happened is that a portal had opened up in my room, she believes, from my closet area. And this being was coming out of that portal, pulling on your body and touching you and throwing you against the wall to wake you up to get your attention, to show you something. She's like, the being, I've never seen this type of being before. She said, it's extremely tall with long legs, long fingers, long head, and uh, long arms. She said, it's completely black. And what it's doing is it's waking you up and it's pointing to something, trying to show you. And she said to me, what it looks like is a location. And inside that location is a mountain or a pond uh, attached to a pond or a river or some kind of water at the bottom. She's like, I'm not sure what it is, but this being wants you to see this location. Um, so, you know, that the cat was looking at the closet every time when she was looking at something walking around in my room. So she, the, you know, Margie hit that point head on um, and it just kind of was mind blowing. And at this point, I had no idea what this means. <laughs> I'm like, why is this happening to me? Um, it's gotten to the point where I was I sleep with a nightlight on and I still sleep with a nightlight on. Um, it's just the way it has to be because it, it seems to me it helps keep them away. <laughs> um, and I was also getting crystals and things like that. And and wanting this to stop and uh, it took over a year for that for it to stop it took a long time and uh, it was just constant constant every night and it was it was you how know to the where i didn't want to sleep in the room how long ago was it uh right so it's 23 24 so about three three and a half years ago it stopped and how long did it last about three years it lasted for two two and a half years this contact the contact in my room dealing yeah. with this over time um it was it was pretty crazy and to this day i've been trying to research different areas and think like man am i missing something 
And then I started having these weird dreams about a year ago of, of a location like that, that looks just like that, but I would have a different dream every night, but it would be the same location in the dream. We would either be camping with our family because that's something our family does, and we'd be camping along the mountainside attached to the lake, going canoeing in our boats. We'd be doing that. Or I'd be back in the military, and we're doing type wire over, over the lake to the other side of the mountain. Um, or I'm with my friends, and we're partying, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, at a band, listening to a band next to the river, and it was blowing my mind. Um, the same location every time, just like she described. And um, to this day, I've been trying to figure it out. I have met people in my journey, like doing this and having people on my show as well, um, that say that they've had visions of that location or they've seen that location with, with somebody at the last interview. And I mean, it's been quite a journey trying to figure out what this is and meeting the people along the way and trying to put the pieces together to figure out what this means. So have you um, been regressed yet? No, I had not. Um, MUFON has a referral list of hypnosis and, you know, all the people. we don't have anybody. They just retired here in Pennsylvania. So that's where, we're, where I'm at with that, trying to figure out where I can, the closest someone that I can work with in the area to possibly do that. Um, you know, we have them in Ohio. We have them in those other states, of course. But here, we're, we're, we're out of hypnosis. They're hypnotherapists. <laughs> Well, um, I've never done one over Skype yet, but I was talking to a hypnotist in Canada. She has worked with um, one of the people that has implants that's very famous for having implants. It's not Woodley. It's not, um, it's not the guy who helped... Roger Lear, it's, uh, well, I can't remember his name off the top of my head. But anyway, uh, she's done a few sessions with him, and she does all of her work over Skype now. She says, she claims it's actually easier over Skype than it is in person. And, really? Uh, I thought that was interesting. And uh, so anyway, uh, if you ever want to. That is interesting. If you want to do that. a session over Skype, let me know. I think you can get all the information you're looking for because uh, all I have to do is regress you to one of those events in your room and it's like you're there and you have um, you have access to all the information that is involving that event as if you were there at the time. But you couldn't see it. So if you're uh, in your subconscious mind, you don't really don't need to see it. You you can um, know what's going on, even though you can't see it with your eyes. Right. So now there was one night where I woke up to um, my window scree screeching and I woke up in complete paralysis where I could not move. So scared to, that I didn't want to move either. And I did see shadows of beings, but I didn't see the actual beings. I seen them hovering over me from behind on the wall. Um, and I was so scared that I stayed there. And the next thing I remember, I woke up in the morning. You, were in, a, you were in a dream or what's going on again? You woke I woke up? up woke up in complete fear. Right. I, I had no idea, couldn't explain what it was. And then I heard my window screech, like something had run its fingers down it or something. I had no right. idea. Right. And then I, against the wall, I could see um, the shadow of a couple of beings behind me. And I could feel the presence of them there. So they're standing behind you and you're paralyzed. Right, right. But then I, I mean, it literally, I was there for maybe, it felt like hours, but it probably wasn't. It was probably only a couple of minutes. And then the next thing I'm know, I'm waking up in the morning. It stayed light in my room. And okay, that's Well, it. all you need to do is write down, If did you make a journal of all this stuff? No, I didn't, and then I was told I should have uh, to remember well, details. Okay, so what you need to do is um, make a list of all the um, the experiences that you want 
to revisit. Just make a list of those events and email it to me and I'll if you want to have a session over Skype, it's up to you. I mean, I don't I'm not going to push my services. If you want to have a session over Skype, we can do it. If not, that's cool. You know, I'm I'm good either way. OK, so just think about it. Yeah, and, absolutely. And uh, so anyway, um, you sound like you've actually told me everything. What what else do you what else have you experienced that you haven't mentioned? So, far. so I mean, that's a lot of the uh, stuff that I've. I mean, that's everything that I've experienced. Oh, well, there's one other sighting. I'm sorry, the most recent UFO sighting. But this was not like the four gold objects that we've seen that day. They were physical objects. You know what I mean? Um, this happened most recently. I think about a year ago. Not even almost a year now. Um, I was at a hotel. Uh, I, had, I was traveling down in um, South Carolina, and um, I'm at a hotel. And um, we had just gotten back to Philly, so we got the hotel. Um, I'm sitting out there. I go out and smoke a cigarette, and it's nighttime. And there's a tree line, maybe, I mean, 500 feet, 600 feet away, not too far. Um, and I'm looking at the top of the tree line, and I'm looking at the sky. And I'm sitting there, and I turn to my right, and this object appears out of the sky. And it looks to me as if it's, a tw it's blue and white, and it's, like, twirly. And it starts from my right hand side and it goes straight. It makes six to seven erratic turns. And once it gets to my my fully my left point of my eyes, it dissipates and disappears. It's gone. It was maybe the quickest sighting, five, six seconds at most, but it wasn't a physical object like a disc or or a, cir a circular craft or a tic tac. It was it was it looked like it was like a mist, a blue white mist. Um and when you see something like that, it really tells you how far and how deep this phenomenon goes, because seeing a physical th thing is a little different than seeing something that looks like a ghost or something that's a mist flying through the air making uh, intelligent controlled turns, <laughs> you know? So um, how old were you or what, what year was it? It doesn't matter your age. Um, how long ago was it the very first time you had anything happen in your room? Do you remember the, the very first event that happened in your room? Did yeah, it was my it was my feet being tugged, my feet being tugged on. Okay, so or the noises that would be the noises first. So okay. I was hearing the little noises in the room first. And what year was that? Relatively speaking, that would have had to been early twenty. Okay. Yeah, that would have been January twenty. And do you remember uh, the most prominent case you were investigating just before that happened? The one, the one, I, I don't need to know the details. I just need to know, do you remember, or I don't even need to know if you want to say it. Do you remember in general the, the most um, interesting, uh, it, it was it an abduction case? Was it a, just it was a private case. But I mean, I well, I'm not saying it wasn't private. We all know it's all it's all private. OK, right. so was it an abduction case or just a light in the sky case? That's all I need to know. I don't know. It was probably a light in the sky case, and this was happening a lot to this individual. OK, so uh, and you, how many times did you go talk to them? It was a few times, like I do it every case, so, at least two or three times. You know? Okay, did it happen after the first time or the last time, or where? Where in these? It was the middle. In the middle. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, all they were seeing is lights in the sky. You sure? That's all. See, they it's tell so me. hard. <laughs> it's so hard. To you don't remember. even. You're not even sure what case you were dealing with at the time. No, I remember the case. I remember it was somebody here in Pennsylvania. I okay. remember who it was. Um, I just don't remember if it was the sighting attached to a, an experience, but they said they were having weird, they were seeing things in the sky for a long time. They were seeing the same kind of objects on a, a nightly basis. Okay. Um, I remember that. And so they were having feelings and sensations that the crafts were there. So they would go to the window or go out on their porch and see these craft, like a contact, like a CE5. Or like okay. So it was more than just some lights in the sky. Yes. A little, a little more. Yes. They, they were, 
they were uh, being contacted mentally to know when the aliens were, or when the craft were coming. Right, and had sensations to look out the window or to go okay. outside. We never progressed beyond that. I don't think we did, no. Okay. Oh, what did they? Theirs progressed? Yeah, theirs. Yeah. Not that I'm aware of that. Okay. Well, I suspect that that person has had a lot deeper contact than you were led to believe. Because if, just thinking about the circumstances, if you were uh, reached out to in a much more personal way than they are, then it doesn't make a lot of sense because if they're being contacted, they're being told that the craft are outside, and then all of a sudden you get an even much more closer set of events, it kind of kind of makes me feel like the, they were already, they've had a lot closer stuff also, just okay. from a logic logical perspective. See, I was thinking when I see when once it all happened, I look back at my life and I remembered the sleepwalking event, the seeing the Santa Claus thing, the feelings I was having in my teenage years. And I was like, well, maybe this was here all along. And now that I'm in the field, my antenna kind of went up and they were like, OK, this maybe is the time to get to go to him. So that's why I wasn't sure if it was a hitchhiker effect from them or it was just me all along. Well, let me uh, let me put it to you another way. So. Uh, do you look at at uh, aliens as being a subset of the paranormal, or do you think they're totally different from each other, unrelated? I think everything is related in some way. Okay, so um, you've read John Keel's book, Mothman Prophecies? No, it's on my wish list, though. <laughs> All right, well. Uh, are you aware of the um, all the? Are you in a general awareness of the how the sightings were occurring around? You, did you see the movie? The Mothman prophecies. Yeah. No. You haven't seen the movie. Okay. No. So, do you know how much do you know about the story at all? Not that much at all. Okay. So the movie is very good the book is also very good but neither one gives you a true sense of what's going on they give you a piece of it and now maybe it's 80 percent or even 90 percent but it's not all of it and so they leave out the both the book and the movie leaves out uh, a chunk i don't know if it's 10 or 20 percent or whatever but they leave out a big chunk of what's going on the Mothman Prophecies is about a being that is uh, actually in it. Uh, there is some part of it in Pennsylvania, in Pennsylvania. So I don't okay. know. My wife told me that from remembering as a child. Uh, anyway, so. Uh, but. He, he makes it out to be. A, sort of like a paranormal type of event. And but the sightings in West, I guess it's West Point, Virginia, in the area where the Silver Bridge collapsed and the story surrounding that, uh, all the sightings of Mothman in that area. Um, what happened before those started was, and you can listen to this on, on YouTube. Uh, I'm fairly certain that it's still out there. There's a video. Uh, the guy, somebody recorded this guy on audio only, and they put it on YouTube a long time ago. And he he was driving down the highway and uh, in his car, and he said some lights came up behind him, like on Close Encounters of the Third Kind, where the, yeah. where the craft uh, come up behind the guy in the truck at the beginning. Right. Similar event except instead of going above him or whatever, this thing goes around him on his right side. And as it's going around him, he looks at it and it goes all the way around him and gets in front of him. And it's like a hovering car and it turns sideways and then it starts slowing down to where he can't 
we has to stop. And then it it kind of like settles down. A door opens on the side like a DeLorean or whatever. And the being gets out of the, the craft, walks towards him, goes around to the right side of the vehicle. He's got his windows up and comes up to the door and knocks on the window. Hmm. And... Uh, and I forgot the rest of the story. I don't remember how it all plays out. But that's an alien that shows up in the same area prior to it, the Mothman ever showing up. Hmm. So the aliens that were there first, and the Mothman came second. So okay. Keel in his book states that um, he, had inter- he claims to have interviewed more experiencers than anybody on Earth at the time. And he says that uh, if you've seen something in the sky, things will start happening in your house. And he doesn't say that they're paranormal. He doesn't say they're aliens. He just says things start happening in the houses of people who see things in the sky. Okay, Okay. so this means that likely the person you were interviewing at the time was and maybe still is having things happen in their house. And then uh, you buy by being close enough to that person, it also started happening to you in your house. So anyway, um, so the paranormal and aliens, they're very, very connected. I'm surprised MUFON has not really um, opened up to that fact. Along yeah, it's, it's not that, I think that it's not that they're open to it. It's that because we're a UFO organization, they want to stick with that. You know, we've had a big thing about that recently. We, we, we don't investigate the paranormal. We investigate UFOs. So that's kind of their standpoint on it. I know. Um, now, the ERT, we work closely with uh, OPUS, um, the Understanding for Paranormal Support. So when we have someone that's more paranormal, we'll send them to OPUS, um, where they have people just like the ERT does, or we'll both work with somebody at the same time. Um, so, well, I mean, I think they're trying, but they, they want to keep that. So right, I got it. So I've interviewed the guy who created and directs Opus in, in my podcast. Okay. Anyway, um, so uh, I guess we're pretty much done unless you want to um, say anything else uh, about anything before we end this. Yeah, um, we, I did just start. I'm the co-founder of UAP Medical Coalition. Um, what we're working to do is educate medical professionals on UAP exposures. Um, so experiencers are no longer misdiagnosed when they go to get medical or professional help. Um, a lot of times I, I know people that have been sent to mental institutions or have been over-medicated, and it really doesn't help the overall situation. Um, it's go, It's been go, going really, really well. We've recruited many medical professionals on our team. And it's going so well, you know, we're getting picked up in different articles and papers. Um, We we were just recently at the uh, conference last year. We had a panel there, Um, but it's going really well. And I think it's going to work out really good for the the experiencers when the time comes. Uh, And we just found out that there's another group in the UK that we're going to be working with. So um, it's if you guys want to check that out, it's at uh, UAPMC.org. Um, really good stuff over there for experiencers, for sure. Well, I'll put I'll put links to all your all your sites underneath my uh, and your bio underneath this uh, interview. So, okay. anything else you want to mention? No, just my show every Thursday, UFO Encounters Worldwide. I get that on all podcast platforms and the Onyx Network Radio on Saturdays. Um, so what yeah. t- when is it Saturday? Uh, so every Thursday, I release the podcast version. Um, so it goes out about four o'clock um, on all podcast platforms. And then the new episode gets played every Thursday at 8 p.m. on the Unex Digital Broadcast Network radio. So you record it on Thursday and you broadcast it on Thursday? To the podcast platforms. And then it gets played on radio on Saturday. Okay. And what radios? Uh, what's the. Give all the details for the podcast and the broadcast. Yep. Both. So the name of the podcast is UFO Encounters Worldwide. Uh, We do our episodes every Thursday. It'll be released about four o'clock on all podcast platforms, Apple, Google, Spotify, all the major platforms. And then on Saturday at 8 p.m., you can listen to it live on the KUNX 
Network Digital Broadcast Radio at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can go to the onxnetwork.org or .com and you can check all the different shows out over there as well as mine and what times are going to be played. And so what do you what do you do on what type of people do you interview on your podcast? Uh, I mean, I've had PhDs, doctors, researchers, investigators, authors, experiencers. Um, we have an experiencer month and a, and a women in the field month every year. Um, I've had, you know, Stephen Bassett. I've had Grant Cameron. I have Tom Carey. I mean, a lot of big names, people from Ancient Aliens. Uh, we just hit our 100th episode, uh, I think, two weeks ago. So this, this week was 101. So that's where we're at now. So you've had it for a while. Yeah. Uh, we just passed our two good. year. Yeah, doing very well. Doing very good. Yeah. You had some big names. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, doing good. Yeah. And Spotify's finally wanting to monetize, so that's that's good. <laughs> um, make a couple so, bucks, you know. So you're gonna get a chunk of change? Yeah, I'm working on it. <laughs> we got some sponsors now, um, but now Spotify wants to start putting some commercials in shows. Um, I just got an alert for that the other day, so it's pretty cool. I'm not gonna get that. A uh, half a billion dollar contract. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh <laughs> yeah. So, um, how does Spotify? Uh, how? What do they do? They give you an offer. What? Do, how does it work? Yeah. So uh, what they do is they give you. Um, you got to record the uh, the um, the commercial, and they give you a script. You just read the script um, and record it. Put some background music in there, and I usually have a. I do my, my show goes to, for 20, 25 minutes. I take a break and then I do my own custom commercials and then I finish the show. So I would just add that commercial right in with my other commercials. Um, Spotify will pay you $14 for every thousand plays and every other pot platform from there will pay you $11 uh, for every thousand plays. So it's not bad. You can't beat it. So it's, the, it, they pay you $14 for every, every person that, Every time there's a click on the recording to play yeah. it. So every time a thousand people listen to that 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 um that episode with that commercial, they'll pay you fourteen dollars from Spotify if it's on Spotify, and if it's any other platform that they're listening on, it'll be eleven dollars. Oh, so you you would have to to get the extra three dollars. You got to limit it to Spotify. Yeah, that's where most of my listeners are anyway, so that's good. <laughs> so are you going to limit your interviews to Spotify only? No, uh, no, no, absolutely not. They go out as soon as I as soon as I publish it, it goes out to all anyway, so it don't matter. Okay. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, I appreciate you coming on the show. Yeah, no problem. I, I hope that you find the right uh, regressionist to give you the information that. I think your awareness, if you're at the point of these things occurring, can pick up a lot of details that you're looking for. So, yeah, it's definitely something we're going to think about for sure. You know what I mean? So right. I want to open that box of goodies up again. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Yeah, I'll think about it, though, for sure. Absolutely. All right. I, well, I want the answers, so eventually I'll probably do that. <laughs> let, me, let me stop the recording. Here we go. All right.